In chapter 12, we're going to talk about the early stages of genetics. So to do that, we're going to need to talk about Gregor Mendel and his experiments in what we call heredity, which is the science of how things get passed on. That is going to lead us to some early experiments, but also to talk about the mathematics behind this. It's going to be very basic. It will involve basic laws of probability. We also need to talk about these things called characteristics and traits. And then once we talk about that, then we'll talk about the laws of inheritance that Mendel was able to work out. In order to fully understand early genetics, we kind of have to put ourselves in a position where we don't know some of the things that we know now. So we need to put ourselves in the position of Gregor Mendel. Uh, we, we need to realize that we don't know anything about chromosomes. Mendel didn't know anything about chromosomes. He certainly didn't know about DNA. We don't know that these things are the genetic material. So when we put it into that perspective, that Mendel was able to work out the laws of genetics is quite fascinating because he didn't know what behind the scenes was happening, but he could describe this phenomenon. That's the power of science. So forget what we think we know about genes. We're a Czech monk who lives in the 1800s. You're pretty good at math and you like to garden. That's kind of the background for understanding Mendel's work. And so Mendel was interested in heredity. Heredity is how traits are passed on from parents to offspring. That's really the core idea that he wanted to understand. So what did Mendel do? Uh, Mendel taught physics and botany and natural science. So he had this broad background. And again, I've talked many times in this course about knowing a lot of different things can be really, really useful. You could make connections between different subjects that can lead to revolutionary ideas. So in the first section, we're going to talk about Mendel's experiments and the laws of probability. We need to understand probability to understand how Mendel worked out the rules of genetics. So we'll talk about the scientific reasons that Mendel's work was a success. Um, and we'll talk about expected outcomes for this thing called a monohybrid cross involving dominant and recessive alleles. But first, let's talk about the model system that Mendel used. So we've talked several times in this course that uh, we're really interested in humans, right? That makes sense. We are humans. We care about how humans uh, reproduce and uh, pass on traits and uh, have disease and things like this. But humans, for various reasons, are not great systems to do uh, experiments on. For Mendel, Mendel used pea plants. Pea plants are a great model system for genetics, particularly because he had easy to observe traits so we could see flower color or seed color or seed shape those are really easy to see they also produce a lot of offspring for genetics and the mathematics behind it we're going to need huge sample sizes here humans we're looking at one maybe two weird cases we can see like up to eight offspring right pea plants create hundreds of offspring uh, and so you can get easily thousands quite quite easily in a small space so a model system is a system with convenient characteristics used to study a specific biological phenomenon. The findings are then applied to other systems. The great thing about evolution is uh, we all share the same mechanisms or many of the same mechanisms, right? We've talked about glycolysis. Everything has glycolysis in it. So we could study that in E. coli and understand how it works in humans. Uh, same thing here. Mendel studied pea plants, but he was able to work out the rules of genetics for all organisms that undergo sexual reproduction. So a big question is, how does genetics work? And before Mendel, there were a couple of ideas, but one of the key hypotheses before Mendel was called the blending theory of inheritance. And this kind of makes sense given what we see. Uh, so the blending theory hypothesizes that the original parental traits are lost or absorbed and blended together. This is supported by what we see in continuous variation, something like human height, where offspring often tend to be a blend of the two parents. So here we have the maternal lineage and the paternal lineage, and then the offspring here is somewhere kind of in the middle between that. So that would kind of make sense, right? Uh, unfortunately, that is not how it works. It's much more interesting than that. And uh, Mendel was coming at it from this perspective, but he set his experiments up very carefully to fully test this. So we'll see that. 
as a side note, I be careful when you Google stuff, because when you Google short dad, tall mom, you get really weird results in Google image search. So why are pea plants the good model system, right? We, well, I just showed you we care about like human height as a trait or something like that. Why not study humans then? Okay, well, as I mentioned before, uh, we have some problems, right? So uh, number one, humans for studying genetics, they don't like to breed the way you want them to breed, all right? So uh, you can't ask somebody, hey, you wanna breed? It's for science. We need to make sure that we have offspring so we can figure out how genetics works. Doesn't really work like that, right? So uh, just cause it's for science doesn't mean people are ethically inclined to do those things. Also, peas have great traits for looking at. They also have something that's really critical and important that plants were used here because plants can self fertilize themselves. They can cross with themselves. As we've talked about previously, plants can do sexual reproduction with themselves. That allows us to create what we call true breeding lines. So we can get really highly inbred lines that will always show the same traits when you breed them with themselves. Some of the traits that we're really interested in, there's a lot of them, but Mendel looked at uh, seven here. Seed shape, round versus wrinkled. Seed color, yellow versus green. Uh, pod form, inflated, constricted. Pod color, flower color. This is an important one, purple versus white. He also looked at flower position on the axis or the terminus of the branches and stem height, tall versus short. Now note, I'm showing you these binary traits, right? It's one form or the other. Okay, back to why the, the pea plant itself is so good. So the self-fertilization is nice. It's also really easy to control crosses between plants. You take a little bit of pollen from one, sprinkle it on the other, and you can actually cover the flowers to make sure that's the only pollination occurring. They produce tons of offspring as well. A, a single plant could produce hundreds of offspring. You look at a human, right? Again, we're talking one, two at most, in most cases. And really critically, the generation time is short. So generation time is the time that goes from one generation to producing a new uh, viable offspring. In peas, that's about, about a year, right? You plant the pea seed, it sprouts, it flowers, it gets pollinated, it produces another seed. All of that will happen within a year. Think about humans. In uh, kind of the shortest case, we're looking into the teens, 14, 15, um, to produce new offspring. And then it takes a year, nine months after that. You're going to take a long time to do these genetic experiments, right? Because in genetics, we're going to need to follow lots of generations here. So Mendel was looking at several generations, thousands of offspring, 30,000 offspring. Uh, so peas were great for this. So I want you to think about this. What would be some other good model systems? Maybe not necessarily for genetics, but other questions we might have as scientists. Go ahead and pause the video. Think about what you're interested in and what type of organisms might be good to study that phenomenon. All right, well, here's some of our model systems that commonly get used. First off, one of the most important ones for molecular biology, stuff that I'm interested in, is E. coli. So we'd spent a lot of time talking about metabolism and things like this, and we'll see a lot of early genetics as well. E. coli is great. E. coli, you can get a new generation every 20 minutes, right? You can keep billions of them in a small test tube. Those are all great traits for doing things, and you can easily make mutants and manipulate them. They're great. They're prokaryotes, though. Yeast is a single-celled eukaryote that a lot of early genetics was done, and it goes through a sexual reproductive cycle. So that's something that E. coli can't do. So yeast has the same benefits, small, you can get a lot of them, they reproduce quickly, but it's a eukaryote. So we can see how eukaryotic genetics work. Drosophila melanogaster, this is an animal, it's a fruit fly. You might not think it, but very, very critical in the history of genetics. We will see that Mendel worked with peas, but people were skeptical as to whether that applied to animals or not. The fruit fly was very critical in confirming that indeed Mendel's rules were followed in animals. And we'll talk a lot about fruit flies in this course. One that's near and dear to my heart, Arabidopsis thaliana. 
It looks like a weed because it is, but this is one of the model plants that we study. I did my undergraduate research studying Arabidopsis, still model development. It's really nice. It's small. It reproduces quickly. You can get a new generation in about a month. Um, and you can self-fertilize it. You can cross it. You can grow it in a small room with growth lights. It's very, very nice to work with. You plant the seeds on little Petri dishes. They germinate. Uh, amazing, amazing model plant. C. elegans, the nematode worm. Very cool system. Uh, there are some nematodes, I think C. elegans is one of them, that they grow to a set number of cells. So you grow them and they grow to, I don't know, let's say 687 cells, right? And you grow another one and it also grows to 687 cells. That's really cool if you're interested in development. What happens if I kill one of those cells during development? Do they continue to develop properly? Uh, or do they no longer make a tail or something like that? Also, some very cool genetic things like RNA interference were discovered in C. elegans. All right, so C. elegans is super cool for development. Uh, also, a real quick generation time. If we want something that's closer, a mammal, to humans, we often use mice. There are many aspects of mice development and growth and biochemical processes that are very similar to us. But there are also some that are different. Uh, if you want to study the flu, mice actually don't get the flu the same way we do. So a lot of flu researchers use ferrets because their immune system functions very similar to ours. So depends on the question you're asking, but there's generally a model system out there to uh, study it. So next time you hear someone in Congress ask, why are we giving money to someone to study worms, right? Why aren't we studying humans? Remember the alternative, right? Do you want to breed for science? Probably not. So that's why we study worms instead of doing experiments on humans, right? You don't want to have to make mutants of your children or something like that to uh, be able to discover the biological principles behind what's going on inside of you. So back to Mendel and his model system, the pea plant. We need to lay down some basics to understand the background behind the pea plant to understand what he's going to conclude from it. Pea plants are diploids, okay? They are two ends, so they have two copies of each chromosome inside each cell. They are eukaryotes. They are capable of self-fertilization. That's super critical. And that means we can create true breeding lines. I wanted to find true breeding very carefully. I'll tell you the basis behind it later once we learn that, but true breeding means that if you keep selfing, which means you cross this plant with itself, self-fertilization, if you keep selfing the plant, they their offspring will keep showing the same trait. So let's say uh, you have a purple flowered plant. If you self that and all of its offspring are purple and you self that and all of its offspring are purple, that's a true breeding line. It breeds true for the purple flower. You could have the same thing for white flowers. Okay, so Mendel's work is going to need these true breeding lines to set the basis for this. All right, this principle here, this set of crosses, as we call them, is super critical. This is called a monohybrid cross. This pattern that I'm going to show you will apply for all monohybrid crosses that we talk about. Uh, monohybrid, we're talking about one type of trait. So in this case, I'm gonna show you flower color and we're hybridizing two lines. So we're crossing two lines. We are starting with what we call the parental generation. We start with true breeding for one trait and true breeding for the other form of the trait. So in this case, the trait is flower color, and one form is purple, and one form is white. We're starting with a true breeding purple line and a true breeding white line. These are the parental generations. We are going to cross them. So Mendel could take pollen from uh, one plant, and that contains the sperm, and he could put it on the stigma, the female uh, organ of the other one, which will then fertilize the ova down in there. Okay, so this is the setup. We cross the parental generation. All right, so we started with our parental generation, true reading purple, true reading white. We cross them and we get their offspring. This is the first filial generation or the F1 generation. What did Mendel observe? He found that when you cross this true reading purple plant with this true reading white flowered plant, all of the F1 progeny had purple flowers. And that purple was identical to the purple of this parent here. Okay, interesting, interesting.
that rules out the blending hypothesis, right? Because if blending was true, we should have got like purple and white combining to form a very light purple. But instead we see a purple identical to the parental generation here and the white trait, the white form has gone missing. That's a little weird. So critically Mendel didn't stop just by observing the F1s. He asked the question, what happens when I cross these with themselves? So Mendel took the F1 generation and took pollen from here and uh, selfed it with the same plant. So the selfing means it's doing sexual reproduction with itself. It's still sexual. So uh, we will see the results of this here. So he selfed the F1 generation. Okay, what happened? Well, something interesting occurred. When Mendel looked at the F2 generation, which is the result of this selfing here, the F2 generation had some white plants in it, but it also had purple plants in it. When he looked at the numbers, he found that there were 705 purple flowers in there and 224 white flowers in there. Okay, if you compare this together, that's three purple flowers for every one white flower. That was interesting. Mathematically, that was kind of an interesting relationship. They're identical in terms of the purple that's there. Same with the white flower. So something happened here, right? It seems that in the F1 generation, one of our units of inheritance, one of the things that was passed on, got masked in the F1, but could reappear in the F2. That was really interesting, right? This is like throwing blending out the window completely. So uh, that that's interesting, okay? But Mendel took it further. Mendel looked at all seven of his traits in here. Mendel looked at flower color, okay? Like I said, 705, what he called the dominant form, the purple form, and 224 of the white form. He looked at seed color. He got 6,222 yellow seeds compared with 2,001 green seeds. Ratio, very similar here. Wrinkled versus round, well, he saw 5,474 round seeds compared with 1,850 uh, wrinkled seeds. Very close to that three to one ratio still. He looked at pod color, same thing. He looked at pod shape, same thing. He looked at flower position and plant height. Every single time for all seven of these traits, he looked at, and he looked at 19,959 offspring of the F2 generation. He found that this pattern always happened. So in the F1 generation, the what he called dominant trait is always present. We saw that in our uh, example here. We saw the purple flower showed up in the F1 of the cross. He saw that what he called the recessive trait disappeared in the F1 and reappeared in the F2. And when he did this, he found that none of these impacted each other. So flower color had no bearing on seed color. These were all independent. So here's a visual representation of this, the monohybrid cross. He started with a true breeding purple flower and a true breeding white flower. These were the parents. He crossed them. That gives us the F1 generation. Mendel found that in the F1 generation, one of the flower colors was always present. He called this the dominant version. In this case, it is the purple flower version. So all of the F1 were dominant trait. When he selfed these, he looked at the F2 generation and there he saw that the recessive trait, the one that had disappeared, reappeared in the F2 and that there was a three to one ratio for every three dominant, there were one recessive that occurred in the F2 generation. So what does Mendel take from this work? Well, the key findings here are that Mendel observed traits were not blended in the F1 generation. They remained separate, okay? That ruled out that blending hypothesis. To explain how this could happen, how they could uh, be discrete and reappear in the F2, 
He hypothesized that there must be two copies of each trait. Each parent gives the offspring one of these copies. Okay, side note, you're a smart, modern human being. We just spent a couple chapters talking about how chromosomes move. Does any of this ring a bell to you here? All right, back to what Mendel could see. Okay, foreshadowing there. There are dominant and recessive forms of traits. Two copies of the dominant will show the dominant form. One copy of the dominant and one copy of the recessive will show the dominant form. And two copies of the recessive will show the recessive type. So we're going to need to talk about phenotype and genotype to fully understand this here. We will come back to phenotype and genotype in a moment. But what I want to tell you right now is Mendel was observing phenotype. What he could see, the flower color, for instance, purple versus white. The genotype, that's what's going on behind the scenes. And Mendel is going to infer the genotype from the phenotype. We'll come back to these in the next section, though. Okay, so uh, we looked at a monohybrid cross where we're looking at one trait, but Mendel also observed what he called the dihybrid cross, where we look at two traits. So in this case, and we'll look at these in more detail later, but a dihybrid cross looks at two traits in one cross. So here we have a yellow round seed versus a green wrinkled seed. Those are both true breeding for those two traits. Seed shape and seed color are the two traits. We have two different versions of them. Yellow green for the color, round wrinkled for the shape. You cross those, you get an F1. In this case, they all showed up as yellow and round. But then you self those, and then you get a lot more combinations that are occurring. This dihybrid cross uh, is very critical. We will look at that again. But the traits that, was, that Mendel was using, the traits that follow his patterns, we call simple Mendelian traits. Now, this does not work in some human traits that we look at because there are multiple factors involved. Think about human height again. We said that seemed to follow blending. That's because there's not just one gene controlling human height. So we will come back to that in the next sections. Let's go ahead and review before we finish up this chapter. I have two flowers here of the same species. I want to understand the genetics behind petal shape in these flowers. I have a true breeding parent that has ruffled petals, and I have a true breeding uh, parent that has straight petals, okay? I cross these and my F1 shows the straight petal form. Which version of this trait is dominant? Go ahead and pause the video, think about that. Okay, hopefully this wasn't a challenge because you remember that the F1 version always shows the dominant form of this. So the straight petals is the dominant form because it showed up in the F1. All right, we will return to this many times, so make sure you understand that concept. Okay, Gregor Mendel, he did really controlled and well-documented experiments to discover these laws of genetics and heredity. He was testing if blending, the blending theory of inheritance was accurate. And as we saw, his results seemed to show that it was not. It was falsified, right? We reject that hypothesis. His model system was the pea plant. It was great because it can self-fertilize. Try doing that with a cow, right? It will not be happy with you. Uh, it produces lots of offspring. It has a very short generation time. And it has easily studied traits. The true breeding lines that he created, when you self them, they continue to same, show the same phenotype or version of the trait. And uh, hybridization is when you cross two true breeding lines for different versions of the same trait. So purple flowers versus white flowers. So these hybridization crosses, where we have two true breeding lines of different versions of the same trait, so our purple flower versus our white flower, they follow the same pattern. We call it a monohybrid cross. We cross those parental generations, the two true breeding lines, we cross them. We observe the F1 phenotype, which we then self with themselves, and that allows us to observe the F2 phenotype. All of the F1s in Mendel's experiment 
showed one version of the trait. He called that the dominant version. That falsified the blending hypothesis. Mendel continued on. He selfed the F1s. And in the F2 generation, that hidden trait, the recessive one that was hiding, it reappeared. And he found that there were always three dominant offspring for every one recessive offspring. Mendel was able to then conclude that behind the scenes, there must have been two units of heritability for each trait. Every individual uh, had some uh, two units of heritability. Some could be masked by others. This is what we will call the genotype once we start talking about what's going on behind the scenes back there, those hidden units of inheritance. All right, that's it for 12.1.